Folklin, we have a great episode for you today. Please make sure you stick around to the end of the episode to find out why the door locks have been changed on someone's house. Like this video, subscribe, and enjoy. And now, we turn to the world of sports. The football season is upon us, and that means it's time to get ready for your fantasy football drafts. The ultimate draft kit from the fantasy footballers is the Cat's Pajamas, and only tool you need. The best rankings in the business. Sleepers, breakouts, values. It's even got a free companion app. Don't be a pigeon-livered foozler. The ultimate draft kit will keep you on the up and up, and keep all the hornswogglers at bay. Don't even think about entering a fantasy football draft without it. Don't be a square. Head to ultimatedraftkit.com today. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome into the podcast. It's the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, nasty people. Oh, and it is plural. It is. I am your host for today, Mike the Fantasy Hitman Wright, joined by decently moderate good friend. Yeah, yeah, like we're buds. Jason Moore, because we can't be best friends today. Andy is still here. He is, he's remote. Am I, am I here? Oh, well, oh you, there he is. You're a little bit here, and that's why I will be... I'm the captain now. <laughs> oh, no. What have we done? <laughs> I'm just along for the ride, this nasty, nasty ride. It's always nasty when I'm in charge. Football <laughs> happened last night. Sort of. I don't of. even know where this nasty thing came from. Oh, and now, I don't know. now it's just, it's even nastier than it used to be. One of it's the just things. Get, the nasty's getting nastier, Mike. The, I don't know how you do that. One of the things that happens on the fantasy football is for <laughs> any new listeners, um, you'll experience. Over time, whenever something happens once and we like it, it's just <laughs> we, it will never go away. If uh, if you've ever listened to a two man footcast, yo. Yo yo yo, 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 yo. So, welcome into the show, everybody. We're going to be talking about some some news, some notes, and breaking down the top 10 wide receivers, the big boys at the top. Before we jump into the quick question, though, reminder, ultimatedraftkit.com. The UDK is available right now. It is getting updated uh, very frequently, just you know, basically every single day. Little bits of things are popping up we here did, and there. We uh, did some massive improvements yesterday, another fine uh, tooth comb through the rankings, but also looking at depth charts, who should be added, who at the bottom and the back end of these drafts. We don't want you to forget about kind of highlighting some of those players, turning some players on, off, and uh, looking at the sleepers, values, breakouts, busts again. So, yeah, al always, always updating, unfortunately, sometimes for injury, but at least you know when something happens, you don't have to question like, oh, no, is my ultimate draft kit up to date? The right. answer is yes. And regardless of all of those facts, uh, don't disappoint Gandalf. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. If you heard it, if you heard the show yesterday, it's yeah. important for the for the safety of Middle Earth that you, uh, you know, get into get into the UDK. And I mean, if you're going to be riding on a blimp or a Zeppelin like uh, Mr. Old Timey Radio there was mm -hmm. you know, reporting from, yeah. it's really good material for them. If you want to follow the show, please do over on the socials, Instagram dot com slash fantasy footballers. We're on the Twitter machine as well, at the FF Ballers, our individuals. Follow Andy at Andy Holloway, at Jason FFL, and I am at FF Hitman. That is it's the quickest and easiest and freest way to did, stay up to date with everything. Did they ever have a good year Zeppelin? Uh, like before the blimp? I Like, I don't even know what the difference between a Zeppelin I, and I a am, blimp I is. I am literally Googling right now. Well, Zeppelin versus blimp. Uh, I, uh, my guess is... It Zeppelin sounds do, cooler. Well, Zeppelins didn't work out really right, well. Right, right. I think it has to do with, is it like the gas that's inside? or I'm thinking rigidity. It, okay. It, it, uh, rigid, someone had to have Googled, because how would you come up with rigidity? That is correct. 
Zeppelin is a type of airship with rigid or semi-rigid structure, so it means it's got uh, metal rings uh, holding the, the blimp structure together. Well, why do those ones go down in a blaze of glory, then? Well, I think uh, sometimes you fill them with the wrong type of gas. There, I don't Mike. think I don't think it was all of them, Mike. I don't think all the Zeppelins went down. I think well, a very it, famous it, Zeppelin went down. It, but that's all. It just takes the one, and you're like, I'm out. It, I, it would make me out on Zeppelins yeah. to slowly burn in the sky. As I mean, it, I still cruise. <laughs> you know, I know about Titanic. That's I true. Mean, that's, that's fair enough. All right, fellas, the quick question of the day. This one comes in from Corbin in Seattle. Not Dallas, which is a little bit oh, okay. disappointing. No, I, I'm I'm with you, but move on. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to make any more? No, no. Fifth, right. fifth Element jokes are one a year, Mike. All right. A couple buddies I know, bada boom. A couple buddies I know purposely try and avoid players or positions with the same bye week. I think it could be advantageous to have uh, because then your other weeks are stronger. What are your thoughts? I'll go to Jason. Yeah, my thoughts are I don't give two farts about bye weeks <laughs> when I'm drafting in redraft leagues. It is one of the, you know, I back in the day, I, I think people have kind of put this notion to bed a while ago. Uh, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago, it did seem like there was like a little bit of you know, kicking the tires on. I'm going to get everybody from the same bye week. So then I have none. I'll just, right. I'll lose that week. And then, but it's. Look, fantasy football is a long and arduous journey through these players, uh, you know, season. So you're going to not have the same roster that you drafted come week four when bye weeks might start at the earliest. This week they don't. This year they don't start until week six. So your team is going to change a ton. I'm not worried at all. Now, obviously, if this is a best ball where you're not making transactions, the team you draft is the team you have. And that's it. You're done at the end of the year uh, or at the end of the draft. Then you have to look at bye weeks, especially when it comes to your onesie positions. If you draft two quarterbacks uh, with the same exact bye week, you, you can still win a league that way. It's not impossible, but it is a guarantee that you're getting zero points on one of those weeks. It, it, it hurts you from the get go. So in best ball onesie positions um, or any position that I think I'm, I'm wanting to draft uh not too many of I will worry about by weeks otherwise who cares Andy. yeah and I I all I'll add to that is I think it's kind of a remnant question that keeps getting asked like it, it is a it's it's a remnant from the early days when there weren't a lot of roster moves and this was a consideration like if you in modern fantasy football you're you're transacting so often I mean that's why this show exists is because it's a constant ever free-flowing roster so I think it's something that comes up because somebody somebody's grandfather used to really consider them and then it's just been passed down but Jason's right I mean just literally not it's not even a tiebreaker for me like it's a non non-thought yeah I mean it's it's a non-thought I, I guess that's the that's that is the limit to what it is for me if I was genuinely between two guys that I and I, I don't feel like that happens for me. I always like one player more than another. But if I was really like, man, I can't decide between these two guys. They're identical. Then, sure. Do, do, does one of them share by week with the other running back you already have on the roster or something like sure, that? Sure, that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I get the question. We get, uh, you know, new people into fantasy football all the time. So, and this show we want it to be accessible to seasoned veterans and beginners. So, totally understand the question. But for me, I. I'm in complete agreement of the roster turnover says I'm not thinking about that uh, at the draft. Let's get into the news. News and notes from around the league. The Hall of Fame game was played last night. Uh, did you guys get to catch any of it? Yeah, I, I caught uh, the majority of the relevant uh, part. The beginning? Yeah, I mean, the, the first half I saw. Um, I watched uh, the halftime show and then kind of trailed off as meaninglessness happened. I didn't have any money on the fun uh, on the under. DFS games or anything like that. Uh, a lot was made of Josh Jacobs' usage and, and really all of the running backs and some of the starters' usage on this team because usually in a in any playoff game or or preseason week one game, let alone the Hall of Fame game, you don't see players getting utilized the way that you did. Look at Jacksonville. They they played nobody. 
Yeah. And, so, yeah, that is the interesting takeaway. Um, I've got my take on it, but I want to hear your guys' thoughts on does that matter to you? It doesn't It doesn't matter to me as much because, first of all, every team has a different philosophy in the preseason. And more importantly to me is this is a, a new coaching staff that is evaluating players. So uh, I think if I was going to take a – um, the Kenyon Drake, where he played depth chart situation yeah. is significant, but Kenyon Drake wasn't really in play for fantasy either. We we may have wanted to know what was back behind Josh Jacobs, and maybe that's a bigger threat to Jacobs because Zamir White was given opportunity before Kenyon Drake. And so, like, Drake was never a threat to me talent-wise to Josh Jacobs. But, yeah, like, and, Jacob, and Jacobs also played well and, you know, chunked away uh, the way he has for years. So... I don't know. Were you guys concerned about it? I, I'm trying not to draw too much from it. Uh, yeah. I'm, I, I'm not overly concerned about it because it, because everybody played. It, like, if it were just Josh Jacobs and then just the backups, I th that would be a little bit concerning and on the radar. My biggest takeaway here from the box score hunting on the Raiders side, I know we didn't have Derek Carr under center, but the running backs, it's like, it, they had a lot of – Exceptions. And, and yeah, and Devontae Adams didn't play either, but it, just, it was interesting to see Josh Jacobs had two, Zamir White had three, Amir Abdullah had two. Like, I mean, you know, we have a completely different system coming in here. Are these running backs going to see the uptick? Like, you can project that because you have McDaniels coming in from the New England system where they have frequently used the running backs that way. I just thought that was interesting that they were so involved there, but then again, so many of the guys were being involved. Do we get the full on Patriot system where you're just ripping your hair out because one week it's Zamir White and you think, oh, the rookie is going to do it. And then out of nowhere, it's Amir Abdullah doing roundhouse kicks in the end zone. Yeah. I mean, when, when you talk about the Patriot system, that is Josh McDaniels. He's been there forever. Yes. And so he is going to utilize multiple backs. He's going to throw to the backs in certain situations. I don't worry at all like I, I've seen some people that are now they're like off of Josh Jacobs when they weren't off before because if he's getting this much run in the Hall of Fame game then uh, maybe he's not the starter if they're not worried about injury we are not capable we as a people are not capable of knowing the ins and outs of every single coaching staff's decisions and what they're trying to actually do so I think it's being overblown right now I don't care very much at all I agree with Andy the only telling thing was that you know as far as the order of operations between the running backs who all played Kenyon Drake was at the end of the line but even that you know you you know he was recovering from injury exactly so you don't know the the big takeaways they did show a little bit on offense of some really cool blocking schemes I thought which was not something you expect to see in uh, you know, in, in the preseason, but it seems like they're working on their screen game. They're working on yeah, they will. getting their blockers out in space, and I think that'll be really valuable, especially for players like Devontae Adams, who I think is going to really be worked into successful screen game usage uh, with, with this coaching staff. Yeah, Jacobs was five carries for 30 yards, so six a carry. Two catches for 14 yards. McDaniel says uh, his quote from last night was, I always think it's good for backs to carry the ball in the preseason. He says there's a lot of things that can happen when you're getting tackled. You can't simulate that in practice. Um, and and so that's why he did what he did, at least in the explanation. Yeah, Andy Reid plays his players. Sean McVay doesn't play his players. It, it, exactly. It's just exactly. it's coach choice, and you can't read it as a universal uh, you know rule and take too much away for, for fantasy. The Buccaneers, we have a couple pieces of information here. Chris Godwin. Returns to practice today for the first time. We're talking seven months away from the ACL surgery. Now, I mean, this was just some light work. I mean, he's not out there getting after it in seven-on-sevens and, and that type of stuff. So this this is a positive sign, absolutely. This is not an, where all systems go. Chris Godwin, week one, is a full-time player or anything like that. But through the draft process, this is the information that we need to see. And our medical guy, uh, Betts, still says he expects a better second half of the year than the first. So 
Yeah, he is still, still a ways away. Like Bowles was saying, he's still a ways away. This isn't. This doesn't mean he's just like, oh, well, if he's ready to go now, he's perfect for week one. It's great on the timeline. It really is because uh, a couple months ago, we were worried that it's going to be November and they're going to bring him along really, really slowly. His ADB started dropping. This is good news, but he is not ready to go yet, so don't overblow it. In bad news, though, Mike Evans, Buccaneers wide receiver, he left practice early. We got a report from head coach Todd Bowles. Says he thinks that Evans tweaked the hamstring. Yoo-hoo! That's not a, a new thing for Mike Evans. He has that type of a situation going on frequently. He doesn't generally miss games. Jay, what was the the number that you yeah, had pulled out? I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I was like I think it was like three or four games he's missed in the last five years. You know, he missed one week last year with a hamstring issue, which is actually kind of impressive that you can only miss a right. single week for a hamstring. This is early enough um, away from the start of the season where hopefully you are fine. What you want to see is you want to see him take some time, come back to practice, practice for a few weeks without re-aggravating it, and then you've got no fears. The Rams have been limiting Matthew Stafford's reps in practice due to a lingering elbow injury. Sean McVay, the head coach, said it's a tricky deal. Uh, this injury is abnormal for a quarterback, adding that this one is more common for Major League Baseball pitchers, McVay did confirm this is not a new injury, and he dealt with the elbow pain last year. He had the uh, Matthew Stafford had an injection this off season for pain. Uh, I kind of mentioned this in passing yesterday during our mayhem draft of uh, when we were talking about you know uh, Allen Robinson, I believe was the player at the time. So it doesn't seem like this thing is going to take Matthew Stafford out this he's not going to need a surgery or anything I'll just out of nowhere in the middle of the season unless you know some kind of catastrophic injury happens like uh, did to Ben Roethlisberger but this will be a pain management thing this will not be fun this will not be a fun situation for Rams fans or if you have Rams fantasy players because every single week it's going to be oh Matthew Stafford rested not, not practicing practice. yeah and you're like oh, oh, come on oh. but then he'll be okay on Sunday, again, this this is not a this is not full red alert yet on Matthew Stafford, but it is certainly something that we need to monitor. Do you guys have any other takes? Yeah, I mean, it it, it I think Big Ben's past scares me because this is how it all started for Big Ben. It was all like, well, it's not really a commonly football injury. This is right. a, a, a more of a baseball injury, and then um, he was fine with it until that injury became, you know, it was like it was hurt, and then it became injured. And so that's just the process you don't want to see happen for Matthew Stafford. They have said, and we have seen, that it when he is practicing, it is not affecting him. He's looked awesome in camp. His, uh, you know, he, he's got all the velocity on the ball. Deep balls look great. So it's really a pain management right now. I'm not going to change anything with regards to okay. drafting him. Um, there's like, oh, Cooper Cup versus Justin Jefferson. If you're worried about it, you can make a flip if you had Jefferson as the two and Cooper Cup one. For now, I am keeping everything uh, full steam ahead, and I'm just going to wait until an injury happens because anybody could be injured. Kirk sure. Cousins could get injured a week three. Sure. Just because, uh, you know, Stafford has pain in his elbow doesn't mean that that's going to become an injury. The Ravens coach, John Harbaugh, on J.K. Dobbins returning to practice. The quote is, he wants to get at, uh, back out there. We'll look at it again on Monday. Maybe he starts doing individual individual drills. Maybe not. It will be up to the doctors. So, again, this is just your reminder. They're taking things very, very slow with J.K. Dobbins. Uh, coming off of the, uh, the knee injury from this past year, even if he's ready week one, expect a workload management and a ramp up through the season so the ADP it's still it's still tough unless you in, unless JK Dobbins turns into rookie season JK Dobbins in about a month or so Andy do you have have you adjusted JK Dobbins in your rankings at all or is he just kind of been you know flat where where you've had him over the last couple of weeks yeah I mean it kind of seems like a he's in a position where he can say whatever he wants to say because the doctors right. are, are going to control the path. Hold me for, back. Hold me back. Doc. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it does seem like he has a tremendous amount of confidence in, in the role. And we heard about Gus Edwards and that, you know, that news was more impactful in my rankings than his desire to get back out on the practice field. The fact that Gus was going to be behind uh, even where Dobbins recovery is. 
but um you know this is a it's a tough backfield to yeah. analyze and predict you have a running back at quarterback already and you have a number of players that you know this team has surprised us we thought that tyson williams was going to get opportunity he didn't they gave it to retreads they brought in mike davis they drafted tyler Beatty. they all the news reports on justice hill are positive like there is risk without question in the baltimore backfield but my best bet's going to be on jk dobbins emerging over the back half of the year as a as the most difference making back in baltimore all right let's talk about wide receivers wide receivers these are the elite of the elite obviously we're talking about the top 10 wide receivers and just a quick note uh we looked at the top 10 adp wide receivers over the past five years we have seen a bust rate of about 44 percent meaning that those guys finished outside of the top 15 of those busts though 55 percent were due to injuries and not just the you know their play on the field you can't predict the injuries but you you know, you want to mitigate and the risk of poor play in the early rounds. Does that so mean at, that, sorry, does that mean that extrapolation here, about 20% actually bust on performance? Uh, your math should check out here. You got, uh, well. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense, right? I mean, it, so you've got like a one in five. I mean, that, that doesn't seem that bad in the world of fantasy football. Right. When you look at top tier wide receivers, if only one in five on average, finished outside the top 15, that, that seems, seems and all that's, right. Uh, wide on, receivers, perfor on performance, that is, obviously. Yeah, wide receivers, is. they're they are slightly safer in all the research that I have done, you know, in terms of getting an injury, a catastrophic injury, and losing away the season. Uh, so well, let's talk about it here. Number one, Cooper Cup. He is our number one consensus wide receiver. Had a season for the ages. Andy and Jason have him at number one. I have him at number two. 14 weeks as a top 12 wide receiver. The fourth wide receiver ever to win the Triple Crown meeting. He led the league in receptions, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns. Joining Jerry Rice, Sterling Sharp, and Steve Smith. His 21.6 fantasy points per game would be second all time to Jerry Rice back in 1995. If you took away all 16 of Cooper Cup's touchdowns, he still would have been the wide receiver five. He had six games where he was either the best wide receiver of the week or the second best wide receiver of the week. <laughs> Absurd. It was as dominant as any, in, you know, I look, I wasn't playing in 1995 for Jerry Rice's season. So this was, in my entire life, the best fantasy football performance of all time. Cooper Cup was outrageously good. He had that mind meld. You know, we call him Cooper Cup of Coffee because he went and get got coffee every morning with Matthew Stafford, and they schemed him perfectly. You look at how often they just designed plays to get him on a linebacker. And I mean, I'm not going away from Cooper Cup. I realize that he will not repeat last year. That that would just be impossible. It was historic. But if he loses 500 yards and four touchdowns, he's still unbelievably great and could still be the wide receiver one. So to me, uh, there's 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 not a ton to talk about negatively with Cooper Cup. You say, oh, Allen Robinson is coming in, but you know you lost Odell Beckham. You lost. Uh, Robert, Robert Woods. Woods so it's it's like obviously there's enough there's plenty of volume here in this offense to support two good wide receivers while having one be a superstar you don't have career years every year I mean that's the truth you and the best comp you could ever have would be Calvin Johnson who put up 1964 yards with the same quarterback and followed that up with a 1492 yard campaign so 500 yards is what Jason just said um and touchdown variation is going to happen as well. I mean, Calvin bounced between 16 to 5 to 12 to 8 with Matthew Stafford. That, you know, you remember the year Calvin Johnson got dragged down on the two yes. yard line seven times. I mean, it, the, the headline is that there is no wide receiver with a higher probability of finishing at number one than Cooper Cup based on his performance and the stability of the offense. I don't mind at all going the Jefferson route. I mean, it, it's kind of mind-blowing that Jefferson is six years younger 
right? And so if you just want to play that game and the age and the risk of injury and, and, and you know, that's, that's fine. I don't mind you picking Justin Jefferson, but you, you know, you're talking about just a, a career year for Cooper Cup and who wouldn't want to try to get part two of that. So uh, Jason has been pretty vocal that if he is at the 103, his pick is Cooper Cup. You still there, Jay? I am still there, yes. Okay, and Andy, the other day you had mentioned that you like the the mid-round wide receivers a lot. So what is the earliest you are willing to take Cooper Cup? I would probably throw a few more running backs into that uh, group at the front. And so if Cooper Cup's sitting there at like six or seven, okay, uh, Jefferson's sitting there at six or seven, that's when I would start to change my outlook on that. But um, you know, it, it makes sense. I, I, people have hesitation about Camara and Henry and, you know, maybe you're, you're not into Dalvin cook as much as you are into Cooper cup. So, um, I just still turn to the running backs cause I just find them so much harder to replace. All right. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with more wide receivers. Our number two wide receiver is Justin Jefferson of the Minnesota Vikings. Andy, Jason, have him at number two. I have him at number one. Justin Jefferson is a beast. He has the most receiving yards ever for a wide receiver through his first two years in the NFL. He beat Odell Beckham Jr. He led the NFL with over 2,000 air yards. He destroys at home, averaging over 100 receiving yards over the course of his short career and he is just he is an absolute go-to guy on third down I think that the question here the conversation for Justin Jefferson is not can he like what's the talent like we're done it's proven he he backed up his rookie career with an incredible sophomore year the question is how do you feel about the Minnesota Vikings passing offense where you have uh the high t kind of crotchety coaching staff they are gone, and now we have Kevin O'Connell that, at least on paper, projects to be a much more pass-heavy approach. Jason, how how are you looking at Justin Jefferson? You said Cooper Cup at the 103, so where in the first are you taking Jefferson? Je like the, Against the other elite running backs, where do you have him? Yeah, Jefferson's four for me. So okay. th those are my, you know, my top four are Christian McCaffrey, Jonathan Taylor, Cooper Cup, and Justin Jefferson. If you wanted to take Justin Jefferson ahead of Cooper Cup, because you look and you say, well, Justin Jefferson's arrow is pointing up from last year. You've got way more passing expectation coming this year for the Vikings, all the beat reporters, everything out of camp was just talking about how this is going to be a team that is passing the ball. And that has not been what they have done over the last several years. Obviously, change you know that sounds better right obviously if you if you end up throwing the ball 100 more times that is a lot more uh targets and receptions and yards for Justin Jefferson to get but there is also a scheme change here and some uh differences that we we haven't seen yet how that could affect Justin Jefferson the, but the point is here his arrow is pointing up from last year he's I mean he's only going into year three which is really unbelievable I mean it's it, it seems like he's yes. you know a, a five or six year vet because he was uh, the wide receiver six his rookie year wide receiver four last year there's really nothing that is a red flag on him he doesn't have uh, an injury history he is very young he's one of if not the most talented uh, wide receiver in the NFL and they're going to pass the ball more but again you know he was the wide receiver four last year so he does need to he does need to go up you know, if he's going to be drafted as, you know, Mike, you've got him as the wide receiver one. Obviously, when you're drafting the wide receiver one, you're you're hoping for the one. You're happy with the top five. You just, right. you know, you're, you you got to be realistic. Um, but if he were to do what he did last year, I think most people, even though it's like, okay, you should be happy with that, I think they would be disappointed if they're now drafting him at the 104, uh, where, where I would be drafting him if he just puts up what he did last year. I would, I would be a little disappointed. I'd be I I'd be really disappointed if I drafted in that high because he 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 had such an impressive season, but because of the cousin situation, the two reasons that I have him behind Cooper Cup, number one, incredibly, thirteen of seventeen weeks he finished at wide receiver ten or lower last year, so he had explosive games. He built stats over the course of the year, but that's weird. Like 
Cooper Cup never really did that, and he never had those dud games, and that's probably more tied into Kirk Cousins having an off game. The other side is there's no way I would bet on Jefferson scoring more than Cooper Cup. Justin Jefferson has more threats to that area of the uh, of his game with Dalvin Cook around the goal line being much more of a threat than the runners that they have in Los Angeles, and then with Adam Thielen's like prowess for the end zone. So those are the two main reasons why I would hesitate on him versus Cooper Cup. But you know, from a talent and you know consistency standpoint, it's hard to beat. So Andy, Dalvin Cook or Justin Jefferson in the first? I'll take Dalvin. Yeah, I'd take Dalvin Cook for position scarcity and for, you know, like I said, I think I can go get somebody else later that, um, you know, is a threat to be the wide receiver four like Jefferson was last year. Wide receiver number three, Jamar Chase of the Cincinnati Bengals, just over 22 years old. <laughs> Justin Jefferson's records may hold up for right now, but <laughs> by the end of this year, those could be crushed by Jamar Chase. He just, like I said, just turned 22. The second most fantasy points by a rookie wide receiver behind only Randy Moss. That's a good name to be connected with. He had the third most 20-yard targets. He averaged 18 yards a reception. And since 2000, only three wide receivers have had an 18 yards per reception and 13 touchdowns in a season. The aforementioned Randy Moss, Jordy Nelson, and Jamar Chase. It was boom bust, though, for Jamar over the second half. T. Higgins, we saw him kind of recover from that injury and be very dominant in stretches. And like Jamar Chase, you know, after the bye week, wide receiver 27, 54, 37, jumps up to wide receiver four and then has an absolute just stinker of a game in week 15. How are you guys feeling about Jamar Chase? Jason, I'll go to you first. I – Love Jamar Chase. I don't have any problem taking him as the first wide receiver, but if you took him as the first wide receiver, what you're hoping for is a change where he becomes the clear cut one in the pecking order targets. You know, him and T. Higgins, they share a lot of similarities as far as, you know. I believe T. Higgins actually had a higher target share. By yeah. the end of the year than Jamar Chase. And, and and I think right now the expectation is for more of that. So when I look at Jamar Chase, the reason he's not ahead of those other two guys is simply because the other two guys project for 100-plus receptions. Like, when I want a – my, you know, if I'm taking a first-round wide receiver, I want a guy who's going to catch the ball 100 times, be super consistent. Jamar Chase will win you weeks. Jamar Chase will win people millions of dollars in DFS with unfathomable weekly finishes. He's tied to a great quarterback only getting better on a team that has so much more room to pass the ball more. I don't know if they will because they have a coward for a coach, but <laughs> – um, they could. They have room to improve there. And so, you know, you're going into year two where Jamar Chase, if at the end of this year he has 110 receptions and he is just the dude, I feel like we're all going to feel stupid and be like, right. ah, we should have seen this coming. He was the best rookie wide receiver of all time, better than Justin Jefferson, and then Justin Jefferson got better, so why wouldn't Jamar Chase? But at the same time, right now, I think the probability says that he's going to be more of that 85 90 reception guy in this offense big giant plays a little bit more volatile and in my redraft leagues I would prefer to have the volume guys over the big play guy Andy well I, I he could score 20 times I mean he could score 16 17 18 19 touchdowns on the year I it, I, I would say if the arrow's pointing up for Jefferson it's pointing up for Chase and and you're right the volume thing is interesting but I, I just think, um, like, I wouldn't blame anybody for taking Jamar Chase uh, at number two over Jefferson. I think he just has so much upside, and he's a physical – he's more physical than Justin Jefferson is, so I think you have a, a higher guarantee of double-digit touchdowns. Where are you, Mike? Uh, I agree. I mean, he's at my – I have him at number four. Uh, my wide receivers just consensus he ended up at number three for us. And I think that the the boom bust, I think it stabilizes a little bit more this year. I, during the live show, I talked about my concerns for uh, Joe Burrow of just his ADP. And, like, I mean, those numbers have to go to the wide receivers. And so if, if uh, using Jason's words, the coward of the coach, which is he a coward because he, he doesn't throw more? 
He's a character who doesn't throw more. If it's short uh, down a distance on fourth down, oh, he's going to punt that ball. This he's going to go for uh, that field goal. This is the Super Bowl uh, head coach, right? That, that is correct. Super Bowl loser. Super Bowl loser. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Just making but, sure how what a coward he is. Yeah, but it, like – the having the the fears of just how efficient Jamar Chase was, it, you know, it reminds you of Tyreek Hill being a rookie and doing that where it's you know kind of hot and cold. And Tyreek Hill figured that out for the most part when he back when he was with uh, Patrick Mahomes. At least Andy, you have uh, Jamar Chase at number four, and seeing who your number three wide receiver is, I think that'll be an interesting discussion here to come up in a couple guys. But number four for us in consensus is Stephon Diggs of the Buffalo Bills. I have him at number three, Jason number four, and Andy at number five. Last year he finished at the wide receiver seven. He had the fifth most targets, the second most red zone targets. But for all the improvement that Josh Allen has made over the last few years, only 118 of his 165 targets were deemed catchable. That's 74th among wide receivers. So we had a little bit of uh, a letdown here for Stephon Diggs. Finishing at the wide receiver seven is a fantastic year. But in the like, you had some red games where you just were really disappointed. And you essentially had one week where you were ecstatic that Stephon Diggs was on your team. The, the amount of true boom week winning games, they just weren't there this year Jason so I'll throw it to you because you you consider Stefan Diggs in that tier with uh with the with the previous wide receivers we've already talked about yeah 100 percent I do and I and I'm I'm sad that you have Diggs three and Chase four I feel like that's what why, I why does that make you sad well because I I want that I, I wish it was me <laughs> that had Diggs above Chase I well, just you know have some courage <laughs> yeah just just fudge my numbers a little bit <laughs> Uh, the, the the truth here for Diggs is that he was disappointing last year for two different reasons. One, uh, where you drafted him and what your hope was was that you know he was going to be the Cooper Cup, and um, he he didn't really have the monstrous performances, uh, the week winning stuff. He was just consistent. But two, given the actual targets he got in the end zone, the targets he got in the red zone, he was and you just brought up the the lack of catchable targets. He was actually inefficient on what we have already seen him do with Josh Allen. So if those numbers all stayed the exact same, the numbers behind the scenes, and they just returned to a a, a, a regular digs josh Allen efficiency level, then he would be far better than he was last year. But now you lose Emmanuel Sanders, you lose Cole Beasley, you've got a lot of targets available there, and I don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility that he's at a 30% target share. I, right now I've got him at 27. A 30% target share in an offense like this would be like 190 targets. Those are those dream seasons. That is, you know, what Cooper Cup was dealing with last year. So I don't, I like for me, Diggs, I, I just talked about how when I'm spending a first-round draft pick, I love Jamar Chase, love the idea that he could – leap to that level, but I prefer the wide receivers who are 100 reception players. That's what Stephon Diggs is. If the touchdowns come, uh, I, you know, I, I, I think that he should 100% be in that same tier of wide receivers, those elite of the elite. And then for me, there's a huge drop off after Diggs. Yeah, Andy. I think I think we disagree a little bit. You know, I love Stephon Diggs. He's my keeper in our league of record. Um, but you know, and and give me twenty six to twenty nine percent target share for Josh Allen every day of the week. I just think you have a uh, more threats to red zone um, effectiveness on this team. Dawson Knox, Gabe Davis is going to be more of a threat than you know if he gets regular snaps, he's going to be more of a threat than Emmanuel Sanders was because he's a a bigger physical player and he's shown that in limited snaps. You have James Cook out of the backfield. You have Josh Allen threatening in the red zone already, and you have Stephon Diggs that's only had one double digit touchdown season out of what seven eight nine in his career so you know at six foot 190 that is something that I don't think you can bank on the way you can with Jamar Chase or or Cooper Cup so I don't put him in that same tier but I have him at five for a reason you know you're going to get 100 catches you're going to get 25 to 30 percent target share with one of the best quarterbacks in football and being somebody that had him on my roster last year I saw the misses I saw these plays that were just kind of like head head scratching like wait what happened here? So, um, but I don't know if I see him having top, th you know, top two upside 
And that's what I put that first tier in is I want a guy that can finish at one. So I have him just slightly lower than you guys. At number five, Devontae Adams on the Packers. Nay, the Raiders. He, the big trade over the offseason, pushing his year 30 around the sun. Andy has him at number three. Uh, so we'll, we'll let Andy kind of steer this conversation. As you can give the numbers for Devontae Adams. It's like last four seasons, averages 11 targets, nearly 100 yards, almost a full touchdown per game. He has been absolutely dominant for fantasy football for years and years, finished as the wide receiver three. But. Send in the car. Send in the car. We have a Derek Carr question. We've the numbers of wide receivers changing teams. We historically they take a dip, but historically elite wide receivers like Stephon Diggs and Devontae Adams don't they don't usually get traded away. So they should be an outlier for that number. But Andy Devontae Adams at number three. Explain yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think he catches 120 plus passes and double digit touchdowns, and I think it's a lock in in but Las Vegas. But did you hear this? Send in the car. Send in the car. You know, the car likes uh, what he likes, and when he when he has a uh, Hunter Renfro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's good evidence towards what I'm saying because you know there was a year two years ago with Darren Waller where it seemed like on every play. He was not necessarily uh, making the right read. He was just hyper-targeting Darren Waller. And then last year, that happened a lot with Hunter Renfro due to a lack of options. And look, this is a player that we've seen do it for a long, long time. I mean, 30-plus percent target share with Aaron Rodgers for three years. Um, you throw it to him, he's going to catch it. And so I do think you have more of a uh, more of the like Hopkins to Arizona, Diggs to Buffalo, transitional type of year for Devontae Adams where I feel like he's safer with a little bit higher upside than a guy like Diggs. I, I I really like – I've had a hard time drafting Devontae Adams because of the, the, the change of the Derek Carr quarterback, but when I really dig into the numbers, I do agree. He's He is one of those very, very, very few guys that is pretty much guaranteed for 100 receptions. Uh, I have him down right now for 110 receptions, so I think he's going to be extremely consistent. The issue I have is 100% touchdowns. You know, when Stephon Diggs changed teams, we weren't sure about Josh Allen, but Josh Allen now we are sure of. He's, right. you know, a top three quarterback. When Hopkins changed teams, we weren't 100% sure of Kyler Murray yet. There was It was hopeful, but Kyler Murray was the 101 and, you know, has been great so far in his career. Derek Carr, we've got a decade of data when it comes to touchdowns. And while he is, I think, a really good quarterback in the NFL, I worry solely about the touchdowns, a place where Devontae Adams has really made his mark. And when you're down and you've got Darren Waller and you've got Hunter Renfro and you've got uh, Josh Jacobs and, and a team that is probably going to like running the ball in as well, I don't see Devontae Adams as the lock for double digit touchdowns anymore. If he ended the season with seven or eight touchdowns, uh, I think people will be disappointed in what he did this year. And, you know, when you've got a guy like Derek Carr, and obviously you could chicken or egg this and say, well, what's, you know, is, is it because he didn't have the receivers like this is why he hasn't thrown for 35, 36 touchdowns recently. But I mean, you know, his touchdowns, Andy, you read this the other day on the show, 23, 27, 21, 19, 22, uh, you, those are his his passing touchdowns, um, and so I that's my big fear with Devontae Adams. That's why he's he's five for me. We we do have you know a couple of years of of very solid wide receivers. I mean, you kind of for the Raiders and uh, for Derek Carr, you got to go back to the the uh, the Amari Cooper, Michael Crabtree days, and we we know that Hunter Renfro came through with uh, a monster performance this year. But does Jason th those touchdown numbers? That's not Josh McDaniel's system. Does the new system give you hope that he could crack the thirty touchdown mark? Uh, it gives me a little bit of hope, but also it's a new system. That's not always easy. Uh, the last time we saw Josh McDaniels take over a head coaching job, it wasn't the smoothest transition. We've heard um, in the past whenever rookie wide receivers were going in with, you know, that this is a hard system to learn. Obviously, these are veterans, so I think they'll be uh, much more. Uh, adaptable to you know picking it up quickly 
but there is that you know okay the the system could change for the better the system could change and be difficult as well so i'm i'm not really factoring that in as a positive or a negative just a variable at number 6 we have debo samuel the the newly paid debo samuel of the san francisco 49ers he finished last year as the wide receiver too it was certainly uh, a tale of two halves for him where he started the first half of the year just crushing with a monster target share and then he turned into a very hybrid player where he was putting up I mean frankly unsustainable numbers as a rusher but we know that he is a tremendous player the San Francisco is bought in but you have some variables you have Trey Lance uh, as his quarterback now Andy how are you feeling yeah I, mean, I know you're not the biggest Trey Lance guy but are you just you so confident in Debo Samuel and Kyle Shanahan that you're not going to let the, the the not a rookie but whatever the sophomore quarterback affect how you feel about Debo moving forward yeah I mean I think you summed it up I I I've been saying Debo deserves more respect for weeks and I think the contract has allowed human beings to finally say, yeah, you know, that's true. I can do it now. I don't know if that was hanging over his head. I don't, I don't know what it is. I feel like, you know, you have a, a wonderful offensive coach who always facilitates his best players getting the football. Um, Debo is one of the more fun players to have in fantasy because of how central he is to the offense. And the fact that, you know, he, he's almost like what Percy Harvin could have been. Sure. Where, where you know, Percy Harvin in brief uninjured stretches was a blast because you got end arounds, handoffs, screen game, downfield, you know, goal line. Like there are so many ways that Debo will be used. And so he stabilizes your fantasy team. And the fact that he's being drafted, you know, six, seven, eight spots behind where he finished last year is kind of perplexing to me. Um, and that's even coming from somebody who doesn't like like I don't like Trey Lance, but I also don't like Jimmy Garoppolo. Okay. So, so like there's not, <laughs> it's not like you're transitioning from a Hall of Famer to a rookie, um, and it's not like Debo was touchdown dependent. He was, you know, on the ground he scored a bunch, but like through the air, like six touchdowns. I mean, does he get ten total between the two? I'll be happy. So, I guess I'm, you know, we're all in the same boat in terms of where we were ranking him. But uh, he's going to be the center of San Francisco. I have risen on him, uh, obviously, since the contract signing, knowing that that uh, worry is gone, that he's not holding in any longer. But, it, you know, it's it's one of those things where his season last year was too efficient. And we know that. We know he won't be as efficient. Now you're a yeah. man, a man, still a man. He is uh, still a man. And so I don't expect him to be that efficient. But you're talking about a season that has just been totally discounted too much because of what Cooper Cup did. Debo Samuel in half PPR scoring scored 300 fantasy points this last year. For context, the year prior, the number one wide receiver was Devontae Adams, who scored 300 fantasy points. The year prior was Michael Thomas. Wow. Michael Thomas' huge year, he, when he was the wide receiver one, he scored 300 fantasy points the year prior to that Tyreek was the wide receiver one with 284 if you 300 deleted fantasy points is unbelievable it's just that Cooper Cup had 367 because he's a madman if you deleted Cooper Cup from our uh, consensus minds and you're talking about taking the number one wide receiver from last year and dumping him no one In would the back be doing of the second. no one would do that yeah no one would do that it really a Cooper Cup is really interesting making Debo Samuel's unbelievable season kind of disappear. The, I think they will use him in the running game a little bit less, which um, for it's ironic, right? Because we talk about the running game being so important for mobile quarterbacks because they score more on the ground than they do through the air. But that's not the case for wide receivers. Wide receivers, 10 yards is 10 yards, whether they're running or whether they're receiving. And it's they're going to get a lot more yards in the receiving game. So it's actually a good thing for his fantasy value if more comes through the air than on the ground. I do think he'll have manufactured touches. And where he's going right now, I've seen him dropping to, oftentimes to the back of the second round. I, I mean, you if you started, if you if he got to the back of the second and you were able to grab like a Christian McCaffrey or, or uh, Jonathan Taylor and then come back and get who 
has a number one wide receiver capability in his range of outcomes and add another running back or stud wide receiver there I'm I'm I find myself weirdly in on Debo it's uh you know it's this is new for me and I and I like it Number seven, CeeDee Lamb of the Dallas Cowboys. It is finally his time to shine. Amari Cooper was traded away for uh, a couple breadcrumbs to the Cleveland Browns, leaving CeeDee Lamb. Then they brought back Michael Gallup, who is still recovering from the ACL. Or uh, I'm sorry, yes, from the ACL. They brought in James Washington to kind of be a, a veteran player. He suffered the Jones fracture. So he's all alone, and this is what we're dealing with. 181 wide receiver targets from last year gone. Amari Cooper, Cedric Wilson, Malik Turner. 44% of targets inside the 10 have been vacated. Dak has been a very good quarterback historically throughout his career. But sometimes, like CeeDee Lamb, the hard thing was we thought he could do it last year even with Amari Cooper on the team, but he had a 31% bust rate this last year he just he would vanish sometimes from from weeks one through ten he was the wide receiver seven but after that he finished inside the top 30 only one more time Jason are you that convinced that now that he is the guy can can he come through and be a top five player for fantasy football he definitely can he has the talent to do it uh, I, I love the talent as a player I worry a little bit about Dak, and while that is maybe weird because Dak is very, very good, and I think the offense is going to be good, I think Dak spreads the ball around. I think he's a better quarterback than he gets credit for, and in so doing, I, and I know you're like, well, who's he going to spread the ball around to? But Dalton exactly. Schultz, Dalton Schultz will be involved. Jalen Tolbert will be involved. Uh, you you've been hearing um, other names. Dennis Houston is a name, a, a undrafted rookie, but he's been popping up left, right, and center. And I'm not saying like, oh, Dennis Houston is the reason that that C.D. Lamb can't be great. What I'm worried about is C.D. Lamb should, based on this roster, have 165 plus targets. That's just not what Dak has ever done with anyone. Is you know his highest uh, kind of wide receiver one usage was way back in the day with Des Bryant. I'm hopeful. I, I I've drafted in in uh you know high money leagues C D Lamb because there is a path here for him to be great to truly have that year three uh not just breakout he broke out last year but his top end fantasy finish everything is lined up for him well so I I don't have a problem taking him but I definitely have worries. Uh, the way that they've utilized him and the way that they've utilized their wide receiver one for the entirety of Dak's career. Andy, are you concerned with about CeeDee Lamb? Well, I mean, I, I would disagree that he's broken out. He basically repeated his rookie year. I'd say that he needs to break out. We need more than six touchdowns from CeeDee Lamb. We need more than 79 receptions from CeeDee Lamb. We, if he's going to be drafted here, which, look, we got him ranked up there because he should, should needs to become has has done <laughs> I mean he needs to have ha, have done it I mean we, he's got all the talent in the world and yet we're sitting here you know talking about you know 1106 that's not that's not impressive in 17 games so um I I hope it happens I do project him to have an uptick and and we need more explosive plays we need we need double digit touchdown CD lamb gentlemen Coming in at number eight, Mike Evans of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He is 29, but he just keeps getting it done over and over. A thousand receiving yards in every single season he has ever played in the NFL. Last year, he finished as the wide receiver eight with only a thousand yards, but 14 touchdowns and the band is back together. They are re-rolling Sands Bruce Arians. But Mike Evans, I know we had the little tweak of the of the hamstring that we talked about at the beginning. But where are we on Mike Evans? Are we if I set Jason, let me set the over under here at 13 and a half touchdowns for Mike Evans. Right Ooh. now based on the information we have today because that's where we are with drafts, are you taking the over or the under? If I was betting real money, I would take the under, under. because injuries under. Uh, are are a real thing. If I'm statting out a, eleven and a half, if I then I would take the over. If I'm statting okay. out a healthy season uh, for Brady and a healthy season for Mike Evans, I do think that his range of outcomes I can't, I can't even imagine fewer than ten touchdowns. He's um, 
great in that area, and he's got a quarterback that knows how to get him the ball in that area. Uh, Brady is going to throw near 40 touchdowns, and Mike Evans will be the predominant beneficiary. So he is a player I've really, really, really liked. Obviously, the news has broken poorly for him. The addition of Julio Godwin being healthy. Now it seems like the targets that were going to be kind of forced and manufactured to be higher won't necessarily be there. And and we did see when they had a healthy cast of characters around Mike Evans, he was still good for fantasy. But his top end, you know, that, that top five finish because you're uh, living in that 150 target zone, that wasn't there. And I don't necessarily expect him to be a top five. I, I, don't, I don't think that range of outcomes is there for him okay. if Godwin is healthy and, and Julio is healthy. Now, those two are current question marks. Uh, but no, I'm I agree. I agree with you. I mean, I, I agree that that range of outcomes isn't there. Like I am at nine because he's going to finish at nine because he always finishes at nine. I mean, he's eight, <laughs> 12, eight, 12, 10, eight. I mean, that's the last four years for Evans. He'll have a thousand yards because, of course, he'll threaten 10 to 15 touchdowns. But he probably won't catch more than 75 passes. Do you do you think he has an outcome that's unseen at this point in his career, Mike? It's something where where he can come out and, you know, enter a tier that he hasn't been in since 2016? Well, I, I misspoke a little bit about the band because uh, the bass player, Rob Gronkowski, left for his own uh, solo album. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, we have two years here with Mike Evans and the plant man, Thomas Brady. 13 touchdowns, 14 touchdowns. And now with Gronk not there, uh, I mean, Jen, I agree with you guys that you know, a lower top 10 finish, that's probably where Mike Evans will be. But if there's anyone in the NFL this year that you're like, this dude showed up and he pulled down 18 touchdowns, like that wouldn't, that wouldn't just be a complete and total shock to me because of the situation here with if Chris Godwin really is off to a slower start, Julio Jones maybe he turns into a touchdown guy here with Tom Brady, but over his Hall of Fame career, touchdowns have not been the game, and then all of the touchdowns that generally go to Gronk in the tight end position, like the the, the tight ends on the roster of Cameron Brake, Kyle Rudolph, and Kate Otten are not – they're not, you know, the guys that are just going to demand end zone targets. So I, I in the range of outcomes, I think a freak top five finish could be there, but for the most part – I'm expecting just a a real solid, you know, uh, the six to ten range for Mike Evans. Mike Williams of the Los Angeles Chargers is coming in at number nine. We have him, you know, a a bit higher than consensus. He last year he finished at the wide receiver ten, got off to an incredible start, and then really fizzled out in the middle of the season before turning it back on at the end, and then. The Los Angeles Chargers turned in a giant bag of money to him saying, you are the future of this team. How are we feeling about Mike Williams, Jason? I think we are feeling hot and bothered as a, as a group. But we see. I would say you are correct. I mean, we're all in on Mike Williams. This is a player that you can get. Um, f you know, we have him as the wide receiver nine. He's currently being drafted uh, ADP as the wide receiver nine. Team. So this isn't a player you need to grab as the, as the wide receiver nine, and that's what's great for the Foot Clan is this is a player that when you can get him near his actual average draft position, he's you're you're adding another great piece that just shouldn't be in that range of the draft. There are question marks around Mike Williams because he kind of disappeared when he was dealing with some injuries in the middle of the year. But when you have Justin Herbert throwing you the ball, you know we just talked about with Mike Williams. It's if Brady's throwing forty touchdowns the primary beneficiary is Mike Evans and here it's Mike Williams because Keenan Allen's not a touchdown guy. I know that the touchdowns of the passing game came uh, in a huge way for Austin Eckler, but you don't just presume that the running back is going to be a real goal line receiving threat. Mike Williams has the talent, the ability, the contract that says he should be the wide receiver one for this team. I think for fantasy purposes, his upside is tremendous. When you are out of the very, very, very top-end wide receivers, the 100-plus reception guys, what you're looking for is who can go out and win me a week. That's Mike Evans. That's the type of player I want once 
the uh, huge 160 plus target guys are out of the way and um you know no, not a lot of people out there in that range around wide receiver 19 have the ability or a pathway towards dominance like Mike Williams has. Yeah, you do need some volatility on your roster because you need that nitro, that turbo, like Jason was saying, that can turn into someone who just wins you the week. It was interesting to see his usage. Like when he was an absolute superstar over those first five weeks, you know, nine-plus targets in four of those five games, then that really settled down. So it was, it was disappointing to see that the usage – change there for Mike Williams but I I'm still in uh, I want I want targets from Justin Herbert and I want those touchdowns as well number 10 oh my God. I can't believe he snuck into our number our top 10 we built this city. Mm. oh we got a new graphic there oh, hold oh, on what, what was that was that a, hold on wait a minute what is let's see we built this city. oh look at that it's it's me and Michael Pittman being best friends Oh my guy! Oh uh, no! Fire player Michael Pittman. Oh Do you want no! In? This is Do you want this in, is a problem. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, are you resigning? I, uh, no! Oh, oh no! I'm not. I'm, I ain't going nowhere. Uh, but there's a certain person who makes our graphics. I hope you enjoyed making graphics for us, Brian, because you're not making another one. Oh yes. Yes. I can't believe what just happened. By the way, do you realize... Also, we I'm unfollowing you on Twitter. You should probably go check <laughs> oh, that. Oh, and I know that that's real. Yeah, Jason, take over. I got to go do something. I, right I, I was just going to say, we've got triple mics in a row. Do you realize that? Mike Evans, Mike Williams, Mike Pittman? That's because uh, in the population of the world, Mike is 90% of, uh, of the male of, population. You can say of us because yes, you yes. are one of the mics. Um, yeah, I mean, we just had the Fire and Ice live show in Los Angeles. I laid out my... Uh, belief in why Michael Pittman, uh, sh you know, should be drafted as a top end guy, why he's going to be a fire pick this year. I think that the Colts offense is going to be great with, um, you know, a former MVP at quarterback who can get the ball to him. Michael Pittman is a, a dominant wide receiver. He breaks a lot of uh, metrics that you want to break to project to have a great next season. The target competition there is you know, uh, uh, Paris Campbell, who, you know, we're in the annual Paris Campbell hype. Uh, Alec Pierce looks good as an incoming rookie draft pick. But, I mean, this is Pittman's team. This is a good offense. This is a young, huge, gigantic player. You know, we talk about and like – he's fiery. He, and he's fiery. So th there's, there's really not much in my viewpoint. When I'm checking my boxes, when I'm watching film – there's really nothing I don't like from Michael Pittman. The 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 little crossing route and run away from guys thing you saw rookie year Michael Pittman, that's not who he is anymore. He's a dominant wide receiver one. He had 129 targets last year. I think that number goes up significantly. And if he becomes one of those 160 target guys, I, I love him. I've got him as a top 10 wide receiver this year. I, I, I am a 13, and I look, I'm, I have no problem saying I'm rising and content with Michael Pittman. The only thing I'll remind people is that he's yet to perform as a wide receiver one. And so part of the bet on Michael Pittman is a bet on Matt Ryan. And that's not been the best bet in recent years. And so I worked that into the way I think about it. Like the best definition for Pittman's fantasy production so far has been good, not great. And we know that statistically. He only had one game last year where he was a 20 plus point, uh, what we define as great in our consistency metrics. Uh, I'd love to see him get to great. And to get to great, he's going to need Matt Ryan to give him more than, you know, he had 26% target share last year. Um, he's going to need more touchdowns. And um, I don't know how much I want to bet on Matt Ryan to make for him to make that leap. But, I mean, 13 would be an improvement on last year. Jason has him at 10, Mike at 11. So I think we're all saying the same thing with the end result on the year. I just hope we get more than one uh, great performance from him because he's physically capable of it. He just needs – opportunity from a more consistent source and hopefully Matt Ryan at this age could be that yeah you, Matt Ryan can be Ryan Tannehill in this situation and where you've got an AJ Brown type body in uh Michael Pittman and the defense is going to have to stop Jonathan Taylor so uh, it's a good I think comparison this is why, I think this is why Mike also loves my guy Michael Pittman <laughs> Mike's so upset right now. I mean I mean this is just <laughs> 
<laughs> yesterday. I mean, this is a hijacking. We're uh, li- This is a live hijacking of a man's best friend. I am not pleased. I mean, the mayor of the city has been dragged and tarred and feathered Look, outside the city by Jason. Yep. The election is over now. I am the mayor. You can you can ask for permission back into the city, Mike, and I might grant it. I can't even Mike didn't even notice it was Jason the first time he hit that button, I don't think. Because it was uh, too outside the realm yeah. of possibility. Yep. Uh I did not like what I saw. And, and it, uh, I love Michael Pittman. Uh the thing I'll throw out here is I mean, number one, Matt Ryan is Way better than Carson Wentz. Uh, you can look at the accuracy numbers on basically any. You can dig down and do any different type of throw of like uh, clean pocket, under pressure, tight man covers. Like Matt Ryan is better than Carson Wentz. And if you're a better quarterback, I think that uh, that I think that the coaching staff of Indianapolis will trust him more. And this is not a knock on on Jonathan Taylor at all. The dude is the Hulk. But 18 rushing touchdowns, that is a lot of rushing touchdowns. And if just a small handful of those turn into passing touchdowns and you bump up Michael Pittman just slightly, I think that he easily can slip into that top 12 position. I love him. Uh, I will be breaking back into the city. <laughs> you better get the uh, get the, the National like, Guard on high alert. It's like breaking back into your own house, Mike. Like someone locked you out of your out of your own house. I got a squatter. And you got to jump the fence and try to get in. I mean, Locks this has is, been changed, brother. I don't even know how Mike's going to deal with this. Um, who I already most, dealt with it. Who are you most worried about busting of the top ten that we've mentioned so far? CD Lamb. That's my, oh, that's that's he's, fair. He's my biggest worry, and I, I want to give you uh, the numbers here to what I was saying. Here's Dak's wide receiver one target through his career. 120 targets, 130 targets, 119 targets, 95 targets, 135, 98. He has never hyper-targeted any wide receiver one, and so we're hoping that changes this year, but that right. that's – that's a big change for a guy who, Andy, you said he hasn't broken out yet. He yeah. needs to, so he scares me. Hey, well, just wait till they sign Cole Beasley back in Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, the uh, leading target receiver back in the day with the 98. Um, do you agree with that? Is he the, yeah. the uh, riskiest? Uh, I mean, yeah. there are a handful of them. Mike Williams is risky to bust. I mean, obviously, we have Michael Pittman a few spots ahead of ADP. Uh, there's some – and Devontae. Devontae has some risk. I'm not – even though I have him ranked where I have him ranked, there's risk with the transition. And that is going to do it for our top 10 wide receivers. Ladies and gentlemen, ultimatedraftkit.com. Make sure you grab it. It's the only tool that will be that you need and will be updated the entire draft season. We'll see you on Monday. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com. And follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.